My name is Jen Sabo Spencer. I'm with the ASLA Stewardship Committee, and I'm super excited about all you guys coming here in this beautiful facility. Make sure that you compost if you can. And then also, um, we wanted to let you know bathrooms are out the door and to the left. Um, if there's an emergency, you're going to go out the doors and to the right. Um, and then also, I wanted to take a little time to thank our planning committee. Um, we had Greg Kanar, Bill Fig, um, Madison Roberts from, or, um, Madison Roberts from Michael Baker, and then Joe Cosgrove from Circulate San Diego, who helped me put this all together. Um, and then I'm going to introduce our moderator, Mike Singleton. He's been in the planning and design profession for over 36 years. Um, he often feels like he's a, a professional metaphor of twister, um, with one foot in planning, community planning, one foot in landscape architecture, and a hand in transportation planning, and another in sustainability. Um, he has an alphabet soup um, of letters after his name, and I'm going to try and get these all right. ASLA, RLA, AICP, CTP, and LEAD AP um, confirms his diversity. And for the last 15 years, he specialized in complete streets, traffic calming, urban forestry, active transportation, transit planning, and pedestrian and bike safety advocacy. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Singleton, our moderator. Thank you. About 10 years ago, I also contemplated going back to SDSU and try to get TE after my name as a traffic engineer. But some internal thinking and, and thought uh, voices in my head were saying, well, that might be a personality conflict. I thought it was better maybe to continue to collaborate with traffic engineers and still keep uh, keep my perspective the way it has been. So, but I found in, our, in, in my profession that requires a lot of different folks to be involved in this and to make some of these streets really kind of work on it. So um, let me get right to the beginning of what I wanted to really talk about here is, let's see, green streets, there we go. Seem to be going into a loop. Anyway, so um, I'll talk a little bit about what, what I consider green streets to be and what uh, some of these other possible streets are all about. Uh, there's a lot of different terms that we all happen to use um, in terms of getting, uh, I think planners are very jargonish. Landscape architects, they, they tend to like to just use abbreviations for everything, but uh, um, planners tend to like to use a lot of different jargons. There's a lot of different terms out there right now that kind of describe what we can do with streets themselves. And so, um, <clears throat> got a security alert. <laughs> is, that, is that going now? Well, it was just going right back to, okay, there we go. All right, and we're all set. Okay, so really green streets. What is it that we're really talking about? This is some of that jargon language that we all use uh, to describe what streets are. I don't think any one of us would have the same definition what a green street is here today. Uh, what I found though is that the unifying title over top of all these different types of streets is, is really called complete streets. And one of the things that I also believe in is that you can have a green street and that doesn't make that street automatically a complete street, but I don't think you can have a complete street without having the green infrastructure associated with it. So it's kind of a subset in my mind as to how these things actually work together. So just some definition of what a complete street is. It's about uh, alternative means to use that street for different purposes besides just vehicular. It's about the idea of reclaiming some uh, streets uh, functions that might be for multiple public purposes beyond just transportation. It's also um, those streets need to function where it's actually uh, calm and safe uh, vehicular volumes that are running through on those streets. Um, it's also very important about safety and universal access for all users, about transit priorities and amenities that might be on that street, and the subset is that it includes green infrastructure, at least in my definition of a complete street. There's a lot of different design and planning uh, tools and trends that are out there, and I say they all kind of come together on a street. You've got what, what's happening relative at the federal and state level about reducing greenhouse gas um, um, and uh, VMTs and energy savings themselves. So that's really an important part that happens on streets. Sustainability is another function. Pedestrian supportive planning, transit supportive planning are all things that really take into account streets. Urban forestry. 
Smart growth, new urbanism depends on good streets and uh, to be really functioning and to create places that work. We have trends of how people are retiring, where age in place and universal access are becoming more and more important and they really have the street as a stage for where that's happening. Smart mobility of, of how we actually get around, active transportation. And then uh, there's a lot of different innovative street treatments that are out there available for people to use to really design streets appropriately. And just the whole idea of a healthy community, where we live and where we play, needs to be a, a type of area that helps support a, an actual healthy community. And to me, it all happens on the streets, and all those different factors have to be taken into account when we talk about complete streets themselves. So there's another term I use, which is reclaimed street, how you take an existing street that isn't complete, and how do you make that kind of convert over to um, being a more complete street. So it's taking a complete, incomplete street and making it more complete, converting excess vehicular space to other, uh, other modes or other uses, adding public realm, walking and sitting places are always part of what a street should be about. And to me, there's a lot of impacts that are associated with our streets, what uh, our concentration, our car-centric uh, whole look on streets has created a lot of uh, impacts that need to be mitigated, and that's what green infrastructure and complete streets is supposed to be doing. So it's things like heat island effect, water and air quality, uh, urban forestry, sustainable materials, all those things you know, really need to be done right to make a street work and to help mitigate for some of those problems that streets actually create. So when we talk about green, what really is green? We have our culture bats this about so much, and I don't think anyone can really kind of decide what really green means. Uh, in my own personal opinion, this is one of the major factors of green, and it's what uh, urban forestry does for streets. And we, we couldn't imagine creating a better machine to turn around our problems with carbon dioxide and particulate matter and the need for oxygen any better than basically what trees actually do. But yet it's one of the toughest things for us as planners and designers to get people to agree to uh, as part of streets. So in terms of uh, what others define green streets as, I looked all these up. So Seattle is known for it. Street that gives priority to pedestrians and open space over other transportation uses. Treatments may include sidewalk widening, landscaping, traffic calming, and other pedestrian features. They're, they've been pretty successful up in Seattle. Portland's even better. They've done a lot more. And they, they focus on stormwater runoff as a resource rather than a waste product. Uh, landscape streets with planters or swales that capture stormwater and allow it to soak in the soil and vegetation that filters pollutants. That's Portland's definition of a green street. EPA has one that talks about infrastructure that involves reducing and treating stormwater. They achieve multiple benefits, such as improved water quality, more livable communities through the integration of stormwater treatment techniques. Smart Growth America, sustainable complete streets include narrow widths, traffic calming, pervious pavements, cool pavements, bioswales, rain gardens, street trees, and encourage low emissions travel. And then, since this is the APA and ASLA joint meeting, APA des describes it as sustainable great, well, what they call a sustainable great street, promotes sustainability through minimizing runoff, reusing water, ensuring groundwater quality, minimizing heat island effects, and responding to climatic demands. In ASLA, I, I'm kind of surprised on this, it's kind of the least green description of, of all the ones that I've seen here. A complete green street provides a diversity of transportation options, balancing a history of autocentric street design in favor of opportunities for cyclists and pedestrians. Sounds more like the you know, traffic engineers would kind of describe it that way, but that's the way ASLA kind of describes it. So um, what I believe a, a, a green street should actually include, it needs to handle stormwater runoff, it looks at, at uh, carbon capture, urban forestry needs to be a part of it, shade is important, and the paving materials, and take opportunities to improve the community. Aesthetics needs to be part of that. Somehow it got on a timer, but most, most people agree the role of trees from an aesthetic standpoint. I don't think anyone argues it, but people tend to dim dismiss all the functional aspects of what a green street can actually provide. They provide human scale, they define edges, they increase spatial wayfinding, they delay runoff, they buffer uh, walkers from vehicles, and they calm traffic through what's called edge friction. So these are all important aspects that you don't hear that much. Everyone says, oh, trees just look beautiful and they don't look at the aspects that are really important. But trees also change the microclimate, and as we know, they can change the global climate, and those are two, two things that bookend such a huge range of what they can actually do. So my philosophy is that, that trees are really important in green streets. 25 to 30 percent of our urban land areas are streets, sidewalks, and alleyways. <clears throat> That's huge. And what can we do with that? And That's a, a huge amount that ought to do something more than just moving vehicles. It's the largest por uh, portion of undeveloped urban land. 
So again, it's a great opportunity. It's already publicly owned and it's accessible uh, to everyone. Um, reallocating these things can help meet a community's needs, even for things like linear parks. Um, better urban design that goes into these things has a high return of investment in terms of land values and supporting commercial districts and things like that. Uh, right of ways, uh, you know, are, are there to connect land uses, people, and places. It's just not a, a place to be zipping through. It's, it's the interface from the street to the land use that's more important than the fact you're just zipping down a particular street. So those are all what I consider to be very important parts of it. When you look at a street, I break them into a street is the broader definition. The road is actually the travel way between curb and curb. And then there's all those different pieces that we have to keep in mind all the time. Uh, when you only, uh, one of my statements is, when you only design for vehicles, your streets will remain mostly devoid of cars and people. It's amazing how super wide streets tend to be void of cars. So, so why were they did, done that way in the first place? Um, but when you look at designing for people, uh, you get people. They fill those spaces. And so that's the biggest difference that, that uh, the philosophy uh, needs to be taken into account because these are public right-of-ways. They're not vehicular right-of-ways, they're public right-of-ways. But yet, this is what we still seem to produce. Um, and it, it's amazing that, you know, maybe as a multimodal street, they can take on another mode and have aviation and aircraft landing on some of these streets that are wide enough. <laughs> Uh, but that's what we seem to keep producing. So anyway, so that's my framework on, on the broader picture of what complete streets may be, what green streets can be defined. Now, each of our speakers are likely to give a slightly different definition to it. And I think all of us are here to kind of to understand what does a green street really mean, what are its components, and what are its benefits. So we're going to start off with having Bob Leiter um, come up and talk about um, uh, green streets and infrastructure, especially as it relates to stormwater. And some of his bio for me to, to get into him, he says that he's been, he's been a distinguished career, had a distinguished career in city and regional planning in California, and I think most of us all, all agree with that. Um, he has over 40 years, and I'm always happy to find someone that has a few more years than I do. Um, and that it, uh, but I have a lot of respect for, for my elders and, and my peers, so <laughs> it's important. Uh, his work in city planning started in 1975. It includes services as a planning director for the cities of Ventura, Escondido, San Rafael, and Chula Vista. And then in 2003, he was appointed director of land use and transportation planning for SANDAG. While serving in that position from 2003 to 2009, Bob was responsible for overseeing regional planning activities in areas of transportation, land use, public facilities, environmental management, and interregional and binational collaboration. He had his plate full. After leaving Sandag in 2009, Bob has worked as a as consultant in urban and environmental planning. He provides consulting assistance in regional and state planning agencies, organizations, and he's focused largely on the implementation of SB 375, California's pioneering climate change legislation. And our state legislation continues to help support us with a lot of new bills to, to make California really stand out as a leader in the, in the US. Bob has also served as an advisor on regional water resource planning uh, issues, working with the San Diego uh, Unified Port District, Western Riverside Council of Governments, and the city of Chula Vista. Uh, Bob holds a BA in political science and an MA in economics from UC Santa Barbara. And in 2008, he was made a fellow of AICP. And uh, with that, I'll have Bob come up and go through his presentation.